The skies over Israel lit up tonight with the streak of 100 ballistic missiles topping world news at this hour, the attack on Israel launched by Iran. Israeli forces were scrambling to intercept them. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is deciding on potential retaliation, a decision that could plunge the Middle East into an all-out war. We're going to be following this throughout the hour, our continued coverage in the Middle East. Families are taking cover as the day turned to night in Israel. This new video showing people in Herzliya, Israel. Iran launched ballistic missiles at Israel, causing sirens to sound across the country. And we're starting to see the damage on the ground as well in Tel Aviv. We want to get to more about this incident and this scary thought. The White House and lawmakers are reacting to the attack. Israeli officials calling this a major escalation via Iran. And NBC's Bree Jackson has the latest from the White House. Warning sirens blaring as a barrage of Iranian ballistic missiles lit up the skies over Israel. This just hours after the White House raised alarms of an imminent attack. President Biden and Vice President Harris meeting with the administration's national security team and monitoring the developments from the Situation Room. Make no mistake, the United States is fully, fully, fully supportive of Israel. The strike follows Israel's ground invasion into Lebanon and an Israeli airstrike over the weekend that killed the leader of the Iran-backed militant group Hezbollah. U.S. officials anticipated a response, warning it could involve more firepower than Iran's retaliatory attack in April. We are proud of the actions that we've taken alongside Israel to, to protect and defend Israel. We have made clear that there will be consequences, severe consequences. President Biden is directing the U.S. military to provide aid and help shoot down missiles targeting Israel. U.S. Navy destroyers deployed to the Middle East region supported the defense of Israel by firing approximately a dozen interceptors against the incoming Iranian missiles. The escalating tensions raising concerns that the U.S. could be drawn into a wider conflict in the Middle East. The United States is probably has the most influence in the region, but still it's limited to stop something like this. The U.S. response to foreign and domestic issues will be front and center in tonight's vice presidential debate. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz and U.S. Senator J.D. Vance meet for the first time in what is likely the last big event before Election Day. In Washington, Bree Jackson, NBC News. There is a lot to cover throughout this hour. We're going to be talking about the vice presidential debate coming up a little bit later. We're also going to be joined by two experts on the rising conflict in the Middle East. That includes a former ambassador to Oman and a political science professor from Metro State in Denver. The family of Luis Garcia has filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Denver Public Schools. It's been a year and a half since someone shot and killed Luis, a 16-year-old outside of East High School, but no one has faced criminal charges. But as Nine News Investigates reporter Kelly Ranke has learned, the family believes they do know who is responsible. Yeah, Kim and Tom, a kid under 18 years old and his mother are listed as defendants, but this complaint primarily focuses on DPS. The family of Luis Garcia believes DPS failed to protect students by removing armed school resource officers. A Denver police car sits outside Denver's East High School. It's a sight that's difficult for Luis Garcia's family, who wishes an officer was there February 13th, 2023 the day someone shot their son near campus. Well, why they do that after everything happened, you know, like if they have that car, those guys right there, you know, like police department right there, my son is still alive. The 16 year old's father, Santos Garcia, spoke in February, one year after Luis died. A belief he had about school resource officers then pushed the family to file a lawsuit against DPS Monday. The wrongful death claim says the district failed to keep students safe by removing all trained and armed SROs. You have to prove negligence, carelessness under the law, the failure to use reasonable care to protect yourself and others from harm. Nine News legal expert Scott Robinson said cases like this are challenging. As long as all reasonable steps are taken to protect the student body, 
that a shooting incident ought not to result in liability. In this case, Luis's family said DPS knew about multiple violent events at East High and failed to investigate prior incidents. It's going to be up to a jury to determine whether the prior incidents and the absence of a school resource officer is adequate to prove negligence. No one has faced criminal charges in connection to this shooting a year and a half later. Yet the lawsuit suggests the family believes they know who is responsible. The boy and his mom are listed as defendants, but not named because of the child's age. Even without a felony conviction or any conviction at all, this civil lawsuit against the parent can go forward. It's just a matter of whether there's adequate proof. The complaint says the mom should have known her son had guns because of posts on his social media and items police found in her home. After this shooting and another shooting at East High involving a student who shot two deans inside the school, the school board voted to reinstate SROs. The attorney for Luis Garcia's family plans to hold a news conference tomorrow morning. Kim and Tom. And maybe that's the opportunity, Kelly, for us to learn a little bit more about the genesis of the lawsuit and, and what they're hoping to get out of this besides some, obviously, some financial gain. Yeah, uh, they are seeking damages. Uh, we reached back out to DPD to see if they could give us an update on this investigation. And Kim, they just told us it's ongoing. Okay, well, it is the investigation that we have all wondered who shot Luis and, and what led to this. So thank you, Kelly. Yeah. If you have a tip for our team to investigate, email it to investigates at 9news.com. Let's take a live look outside the first day of October, and it did feel cooler, especially overnight. Yeah, if you woke up this morning, it was not only <laughs> October, it felt like October, but another record hot temperature in the forecast, Kathy? That's exactly right, you guys, and that's not news that anybody wants to hear from the 9 News Weather Center. It was a chilly start to the day with 39 degrees out at DIA, and we're watching a little bit of smoke and haze along the front range, but a beautiful day nonetheless. If you were out early walking the dogs this morning like I was, you're like, why didn't I bring gloves? It was so chilly. We haven't seen numbers like this since May 24th, and look at the afternoon highs, seasonal highs in the mid-70s. It's just been lovely, but temperatures are going to flip and go 10 degrees the other direction tomorrow with a wind shift we expect overnight. So a brief cool down today. We once again are talking about elevated fire danger and another possible record high temperature. You'll notice to the north of us are high clouds to the south are showers, but here in Colorado, not a lot of water in the form of clouds or rain coming into the state. Winds are starting to increase out of the south and elevated fire danger over northern Colorado means red flag warnings are posted and those extend up into to Wyoming, western Nebraska, and Kansas due to the potential for wind gusts to 40 miles per hour and those low relative humidity values. Temperatures in the 70s now drop into the 60s overnight. Coming up, I'll have the timing and impact of that next weather change. Not one, but two days with potential record high temperatures. So many people are watching the situation in western North Carolina, but the situation there seems to grow more dire by the hour across the mountain communities. Four days after Hurricane Helene, many places still cut off from much needed supplies. More than 130 people are dead across six states impacted by the hurricane. More than a third of those victims are from the Carolinas. 600 people are still missing. Many survivors are without power, cell service, access to clean water, and fuel is scarce. Operation Airdrop has been flying in supplies where they can, and in other communities, essentials are being carried in by donkeys. Today, the Colorado chapter of the Red Cross put out an urgent request for more volunteers. About 20 Colorado volunteers, including Kim Miles from Highlands Ranch, are now deployed in the southeast. Those volunteers will be deployed for about two weeks, at which point more volunteers will be needed to take their spots. The Red Cross says it's a unique situation with widespread damage across so many states at once. We have levels in the Red Cross. So level one is a home fire. Level seven is a Katrina. Uh, in North Carolina right now, we've got a level seven going on. Now, if you would like to sign up and help, we have more information right now on 9news.com. Today marks a unique day in Denver history. This marks 25 years of sports and everything else that's gone on at Ball Arena. It all started with a concert. It was on this date in 1999 that Celine Dion hit the stage, the very first event of what was then the Pepsi Center. Dion dedicated the concerts to victims and survivors of the Columbine shooting. 
The Avalanche would later play their first game October 13th of 1999. Of course, the arena has been home to the Avs, the Nuggets, and the Mammoth. It is the largest indoor concert venue here in Colorado. It can host more than 20,000 people for concerts and other events. More importantly for many people, we have seen two Stanley Cup champions play there and an NBA champion as well. And, and two of those three titles were won in that building. In that building. Yeah. Isn't that cool? I mean, do you remember when they opened? I remember they opened. It was the thing. It was like, oh, check out the locker rooms and the seating and no club seats was a big deal. Yeah, and it's funny because uh, it, it's so much more uh, creature comfortable, uh, nicer than McNichols Arena was. Yeah. But I miss Big Mac. <laughs> I know. 25 years later, yeah. I still miss Big Mac. We got good memories there, and we're hoping to make more memories at Ball Arena. Don't forget, you can watch your teams this season right here. Nine News will broadcast 40 games, Avs and Nuggets games, on KTVD. It starts Tuesday, October 29th. That's the Nuggets at the Nets, and October 24th for the Avs at Utah. You can watch each game for free over the air on KTVD. Ten of those games will also be broadcast on Nine News.